Good evening, and welcome to tonight's program, Health Benefits of Renewable Energy Choices. I'm Vicki Cocoluto, a member of the Winchester League of Women Voters Steering Committee, and I want to thank you for coming out for this program, which is the third in a continuing series of climate and energy solutions programs coordinated by a special committee of the Massachusetts State League. One of our members here in Winchester, Ruth Trimarkey, has been a very active participant on that state committee and a key person responsible for developing tonight's program and bringing it to Winchester. Thanks to our town board for making this auditorium available for public discussion on a topic of crucial interest. And we're gratified by the broad community support represented by our co-sponsors, the Wright Lock Farm Conservancy and the Winchester Farmers Market Community Hub. Public health is a high priority for our co-sponsors and education on public policy issues, such as a role for carbon pricing, is central to the League's mission. Our speaker tonight is going to connect the two, public health and public policy. And now I would like to invite Karen Price, a League member from Needham and a state leader, who is co-chair of the Massachusetts League's Steering Committee for Environmental Action and Advocacy to say a few words on behalf of the State League. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts, I'd also like to welcome you. We are a statewide organization with 47 local leagues and units operating in over 100 communities in the Commonwealth. Tonight's forum, as Vicki said, is the third in our series. This forum is also a mass energy green event. What does that mean? Well, through a donation to mass energy for this specific event, for each kilowatt hour of energy we consume here tonight, one kilowatt hour of electricity, I meant to say electricity, comes into, onto our electric grid from a wind turbine in New England. Our goal is to green all of our events. The League has been at the forefront of environmental and energy issues for almost all of our 100-year history, educating our members and the public and calling for action to preserve and protect the world we share. In Massachusetts, the League has supported groundbreaking legislation such as the Global Warming Solution Act and the Green Communities Act, and advocated long ago for the creation and funding of the Massachusetts Water Resources Commission. A League representative sat on the State Superfund Advisory Committee to oversee the cleanup of hazardous waste spills and sites. And more than 40 years ago, the League was a co-founder of the Boston Harbor Association, whose original mission was to clean up Boston Harbor and restore the waterfront. And I think we have succeeded in that, and it proves that we can tackle big problems that succeed if we work together toward a common goal. Our current legislative work is listed on the back of the program. The State League's advocacy for environmental legislation is led by Lana Zamaro, who is here, uh, who co-chairs the steering committee with me. We have two more forums, uh, one in Lexington and one in Falmouth. The one in Lexington, right down the road, is on October 19th, so I hope you'll join us for that. You can find information on uh, both forums in our, on our website, lwvma.org. Now I'd like to turn the podium over to Ruth Trimarkey. As uh, Vicki said, she's representing, uh, she represents the League on our committee, the Winchester League, but she also is representing several groups here. She led the effort to bring the forum to Winchester, and on, on behalf of the State League and the Steering Committee, we thank her and all the, organizer, all the organizers here in the Winchester League. Thank you. thank you, and 
welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Ruth Tremarkey. I'm a member of all four of the community groups co-sponsoring this evening's event and talk by Dr. Jonathan Buonacore on the health benefits of renewable energy choices, a role for carbon pricing. Winchester has received a number of well-deserved green awards, and in our pursuit of healthier environmental options, it's particularly delightful to bring together all four of these community organizations to co-sponsor the talk. The Wright Lock Farm Conservancy, the Winchester Farmers Market Community Hub, and the League of Women Voters of Winchester and Massachusetts are excited to bring Dr. Buonacore to Winchester. I extend my appreciation to all four groups and to all of you for attending this evening. Jonathan Buonacore's SCD is a program leader for the Climate, Energy, and Health Program at the Center for Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jonathan's research topics range from improving understanding of the health and environmental risks of pipelines, underground gas storage, and other midstream oil and gas infrastructure, to understanding health co-benefits of the US EPA's Clean Power Plan. The scope of his research covers energy efficiency and renewable energy projects to understanding the health implications of fires in Indonesia. Jonathan received his doctoral degree from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in Environmental Science and Risk Management in November 2013. Jonathan also holds a Master of Science in Industrial Hygiene from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Policy from Clarkson University. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan to Winchester. All right, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for um, the groups hosting this, for putting this gorgeous venue together. Um, yeah, so as Ruth said, I'm gonna be talking to you a good bit today about some, some of my research I've been doing, mostly focusing um, on a lot of the co-benefits work since that's mostly of interest to what's happening today. Um, but first, I just wanted to, unfortunately, give everyone a sort of a reminder of what it is that we're really dealing with here, which is uh, the threat of climate change. So this here is a satellite image of um, Hurricane Hart, no, sorry, not a satellite image. This is a photo taken from the International Space Station um, of Hurricane Harvey close to the point in time when it hit the Texas coast. And this is what the rain totals look like. Um, from Hurricane Harvey. So in and around Houston, you had um, levels of rain approaching about f 40 and above inches, um, which is completely unprecedented for this area. And it resulted in some um, really tragic flooding, a lot of people getting displaced. And I think we're still trying to wrap our heads around exactly um, how much of a disaster this has been for Houston and uh, the rest of South Texas. Um, but it doesn't stop there. This is a picture of a fire happening in, believe it or not, Greenland. Um, this doesn't happen normally, um, because it be, but because it's been abnormally dry there, um, they're starting to get landscape fires, which they've never really seen that much before. Um, the person who works for the, I believe it's the Danish uh, meteorological agency actually said, you know, I never thought I'd have to start paying attention to fires in Greenland, but in our new climate, he has to. And this is uh, another satellite image, this time ta taken over uh, Washington State and over British Columbia, um, again showing areas that um, had landscape fires, forest fires in this case, um, mostly up here north of Vancouver, but with a few in uh, Eastern Washington State as well. So again, this is not an unprecedented event to have forest fires, but these are things that are getting more and more frequent um, as the climate is changing. And this is a really stark reminder of exactly how much work it is that we have to do. Um, this is some research showing um, so I'm sure most people in this room are familiar with the Paris Agreement. We have, as a world, most of the world, set a goal of trying to keep uh, climate change below two degrees Celsius, ideally one and a half degrees. Um, based on sort of business as usual and how the variety of economic and social systems and uh, the physical science systems behave, 
Um, this group recently estimated we have a 5% chance of making that goal of 2 degrees Celsius. And we have a 1% chance of meeting this goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is um, really important to a lot of island nations in particular, since some of the climate projections are showing that at 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, a lot of the Pacific Islands, large portions of Bangladesh, uh, Florida, places like that will be underwater. Um, so we've already kind of, in a way, sort of agreed to ourselves as a world that we're going to have to accept some loss. Um, this is a chart showing a lot of basically the trajectory that we need to make in order to hit two degrees Celsius. There's a lot going on here, um, but what I want you to take away is that we're on this sort of red track here. Um, we need to be on the blue track to get us to two degrees Celsius. Um, probably need no reminder that this summer was really, really hot. Um, it was a little less hot than it was last summer, but that doesn't mean climate change is false. Um, this July was tied for being the hottest summer, 2017, and August, this August was the second hottest August that we've had. So what this is showing is coming out of some of that same modeling, basically in order to get to the climate where um, it's not out of bounds of what human civilization evolved in, we need to cut our, our carbon emissions in half every decade, period. So what this means is that in order to do that, there needs to be a rapid deployment of renewables, um, electrification of much of our uh, energy systems, um, reduced forest destruction because they do store a lot of carbon in the forests, um, and really realign both government and finance in order to really meet this goal. So this is just, again, showing the, um, one, of the path, one of the few pathways we have available. Um, to get us there. They're calling it a global carbon law, which is sort of similar to Moore's law, which is the idea that computers get um, twice as fast every decade. So they made the analogous argument here um, to put this together, just that we need to cut our emissions in half every decade. And to do that, um, really what we need to do is ideally double the amount of renewable energy we have, not just for electricity, but for all energy sources, at least every decade. Um, so it's a really, really, we're kind of on track right now, um, but it's a really, it's a lot of work we're going to have to do for a long time in order to really decarbonize our energy system to meet these goals that we've set. Um, and there's other groups here, um, again, doing a lot of economic modeling and that kind of thing, um, basically showing that if we want to meet two degrees, we cannot be building fossil fuel power plants. We should be done this year, no more. Um, the reason for that is because once, um, a financial investment is made, the investor is going to want to return on their investment. So because of that, um, there's a lot of incentive in place once something is built um, to keep it in place. So um, no, no one who has made an investment in building a power plant is going to say, sure, it's fine if you decommission it in 20 years, I'll just take that financial hit. Um, it's not gonna happen. So the idea that these folks put forward is that we should be done building fossil fuel power plants, period. And this is why. One example more close to home. Um, this is what Boston will look like if a Category 3 hurricane hits. Um, in particular here, we um, drew out a lot of the hospitals. Um, so Mass General, Tufts, um, BMC, Children's Hospital, Beth Israel, Brigham and Women's will all have water on their doorstep or perhaps in their ambulance bays. Um, access will be fairly difficult power supply will be fairly questionable. Um, and I heard, if there's any medical folks in the audience, you know this is terrible. Um, but I got to hear a talk from a woman who was working at the, um, in New York City when Hurricane Sandy hit. And she said um, when some of the hospitals there lost power, there were um, nurses and doctors carrying patients by hand downstairs because the elevators were out and the backup generators were flooded. So that's a really bad situation to be in. So in order to fix it, <laughs> there's a lot of things that we do need to understand. Um, the first one is to really put some deep thought into thinking about um, what pollution actually is. 
So you look at this and you say, okay, it's air pollution, so what is that? Um, it's things like NOx, it's things like particles, ash soot that happen when you burn fossil fuels or anything else. Okay, that's great. Um, that's the literal definition of pollution. Um, so why, next question you should be asking is, okay, why does pollution exist? So we know it's this thing that's bad for people or bad for the environment. Um, and if it's bad, so why is it that it's not just automatically controlled? Why don't all power plants have pollution controls? Why are they allowed to emit stuff like this? Um, the answer to that question is really an economic one, is that it's, um, it costs money to do pollution controls. Um, so there's no financial incentive for a company who is burning fossil fuels, polluting the water, um, or doing anything else like that to put those controls in place. Um, there's been a lot of arguments made that that's sort of one of the major roles that a government has, is to say, don't do that. The reason for that is because, um, I apologize for giving anybody um, economics PTSD, but we have to do this, um, is it's an externality. So what that is in economic terms is, it's a market failure, um, meaning that there is a transaction going on between two different people, and some third party is affected, but the third party doesn't have any say as to whether this thing happens or not. So, for example, you might build a flower garden. Your neighbors like looking at the flower garden when they look out the window. Um, maybe when your neighbors go to sell the house, they can get a slightly better price for it because, um, because the view's a little better. However, even though your neighbors got some benefit for that, they didn't pay you to put up the flower garden. So that's a positive externality. A negative one is traffic. There's people in your way, there's only so much road space. They're making you go slower and putting you at higher risk of an accident, but they're not paying for you for that. Uh, so that's an externality. And pollution is one of these as well, where um, somebody is purchasing something from someone else, a power plant, they're driving, they're doing industrial activity, whatever. Um, somebody is buying that, somebody is providing that, but third parties, known as everybody else, are feeling the effects of the pollution and uh, the company producing the pollution doesn't have to pay for it. That's what an externality is, and that's what we're correcting. And the whole trouble here with these is that the prices on these externalities, they don't reflect these full costs that are occurred to third parties. Um, so the idea is that in economic theory, um, the free market, the invisible hand, whatever you want to call it, will not produce socially optimal results on its own, period. So this will be over in a second. <laughs> Um, the green, for anybody who's taken economics, the green here, it would be a demand curve, so this is how much people are willing to buy. Um, the black here is the private cost, meaning how much it costs the person receiving. And then here's the actual cost when you include these social costs of pollution. So what ends up happening is we really ideally would get up here where the polluter is paying for the pollution. But if they're not paying, what ends up happening is we get to this realized equilibrium where there's too much stuff being produced for too cheap. Um, and it's not working out in the ideal way for everybody. Um, Upton Sinclair put it a little bit more bluntly. Uh, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. So what this is called in my world, science world, is it's called a uh, common, common problem, where there's one common resource that everybody sort of has to learn how to share, um, but the resource has limits as far as what it's able to, um, able to support. So for the example of the Boston Common, um, it did start as a place for people to graze, basically, right? So every single individual person in Boston who has a sheep, a cow, whatever, would put their sheep or cow on the common, right? But there's only so much space. Nobody, had, nobody has any actual incentive um, to, say, not put one of their cows out, because it's going to work out badly for them, but it has to be done in order to protect the resource. So because this um, kind of incentive system is in play here, you have these commons pool 
what's called a common pool resource problem where everybody tries to exploit it as much as possible before everybody else does, um, and then you end up crashing the resource. Um, what happened in Boston Common, it's what's happened to the cod fishery around here. Um, it's also what drove Russell Crowe insane when he had to play um, in a beautiful mind. Um, yeah, so if <laughs> he, um, I'm now blanking on what the person's name is who's, who did game theory. Um, sorry? It's not Jon Snow. It'll, it'll come to me in like five minutes, I'm sure. Um, but you could make the argument that a lot of the mental health issues he had is because this is a very, very difficult problem to deal with. So climate is the biggest one of these problems that we've had to deal with thus far. Um, it's a commons pool problem because we're sharing one planet. Um, and I showed you a couple of the different possible health impacts with flooding um, from sea level rise or when a hurricane strikes, um, health impacts of air pollution from forest fires. I'm gonna go through a few other ones as well that might be a little bit less intuitive. These other, this other one here, it's risk of conflict. So what's going on here is basically looking at whether or not there was a war in a given location or some kind of civil conflict, um, and whether or not there was a relationship between higher risk of there being some kind of conflict and temperature or precipitation. Um, and when they went through this exercise, they found, yes, there is a relationship. Um, when the temperature gets hotter, especially if it's in the Pacific Ocean related to El Nino, um, you have much higher risk of conflict in these areas where, um, where it's getting hotter. There's one example I decided to cut for time, um, basically going through the risk of, um, basically showing that the drought that led up, the drought that led up to the movement of people within Syria um, was made two to three times more likely by climate change. So the paper makes the argument that um, climate change made the war in Syria two to three times more likely. So this is getting a little bit closer to home here, um, looking at a whole variety of different impacts that will get worse due to climate change. Um, ranges from agricultural yields, where a lot of places are going to have um, 